The other day, we um, had some coffee after shopping, and we bumped into an old friend. Hadn't seen him for a little while. Used to have the allotment next to us. And his daughter joined us, and she said she had two sons. And then she said, I've put a tracker on their phone so that I can know where they are throughout the whole of the day. And at first, I was a bit horrified because I thought, I didn't say anything, but I thought, gosh, that's a bit controlling. And I thought, are they really that naughty that she has to keep a tracker on them? But the more I thought about it, I looked another way at this, and I saw that actually it was indication of her great love for her children, that she wanted them to have their freedom, but she wanted to know where they were so that she could um, be there if they needed her. And it clarified a bit more a verse that's always caused me a problem and which we read. And it's Psalm 139, verse 3. When God says, it says in the psalm, God, you know my going out and my coming in, my lying down and my rising. And I, that always worried me a little bit because I thought, a bit controlling, but it isn't. It's an indication of God's great love for us. He wants to, us to have freedom, but he wants to know where we are so that when we're in trouble, when we mess up like we do, he's there to help us. He will put people in our way when we need someone. Often we find someone is there. People call coincidences. And we've all had them in our lives. But I like to see them, and I know that it's God looking after me. I know when you go out, and I know when you come in. I know when you sit down, and I know when you get up. How comforting is that? Coincidences like happened to us when we were in Malta, we watched a firework display. Um, I hadn't put sufficient clothes on because it was a very cold evening. And by the time we'd waited a long time, by the time we saw the fireworks, I'd already got a cold. I was shivering. And I suddenly said to Arthur, I don't feel well. And I sat down. <clears throat> and I heard a lady behind me say, is the lady not well? And I promptly passed out. When I came round, I was conscious of someone propping me up. And the same voice said, don't worry, everything's all right. I'm a paramedic attached to the hospital and I was sent for an ambulance. Coincident, in that great big gathering, watching fireworks, I stand in front of a paramedic when I pass out. That is the love of God. I know you're going out, and I know you're coming in. I know you're sitting down, and I know you're rising. Mm -hmm. It's a sign that God loves us. How do we know? We know because in John 3, 16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. That whosoever believeth on him will have everlasting life. God so loved the world. And I like that word, world, because it includes me. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Now, I never had any children of my own. And so I can only imagine what this cost God to send his son. He sent his son knowing that he was going to die the most excruciating death that man's ever devised. And he sent him because 
he loved the world, you and me. You see, Jesus was sinless, and only he could pay the price, because it's as if we're this side and we're sinful. You know, let, we all do things wrong. God is here, and he's holy, and he can't abide sin. And in between, there's this chasm. Now, in the Old Testament, they tried to bridge it with sacrifices. But the sacrifices had to be repeated because they only atoned for the sin of that week. And next week, they'd done more. God wanted a sacrifice once and for all, and that was for Jesus. That was Jesus. People say, if I go to church every week, I'll be all right. But unfortunately, that doesn't quite reach God. They say, I will do everything I can to be good. That, that will get me there. But it doesn't. The only thing that stopped the chasm between us and God is the cross of Jesus Christ, because that reaches both sides. And so it's through the cross of Jesus Christ that we can know forgiveness of sin. And it, Jesus died that death for the same reason that God sent his son, because he loved us so much. And it was as if God piled all the, the, the sins of the world onto Jesus, saw all the sins on Jesus on the cross. And because they were sins, God could have nothing to do with it. And so, at the hour when Jesus needed him most, God had to turn his back and walk away. Can you imagine what that cost God? At the very moment when his son needed him most, God turned his back and had to walk away in order for the sacrifice to be complete. And he did it because he loved us. <laughs> Amazing love. How can it be that thou, my Lord, should love me? I know you're going out and you're coming in. But you might be sitting there wondering and saying the age-old question, if God loves us so much, why do we have wars? Why doesn't he stop the war in Ukraine? Why doesn't he stop the war in Syria? Why doesn't he stop the war in Palestine? Why doesn't he stop all the trouble in Nigeria? Why are the hills burning, destroying livelihood? Why is there famine in Africa? I don't know. I don't know. But I do know this, that God is in control and he has it all in his hand. And part of the answer is something we keep coming back to in our study on a Wednesday, and that is because God sees a bigger picture than we do. It's almost as if I, in my little mind, can see just like my, the screen on my mobile phone, right? That's my experience, that's my understanding, this little screen. God sees like, and I'm probably gonna show me how you Cinema scope, that great big scene, the screen that appeared in cinemas, right the way around the front of the cinema, and we saw a whole lot more. That's how God sees. He, we see this. God sees that. And he knows when the time is right. Why doesn't God answer my prayers when I'm praying for people to come to the Lord? Why God, 
doesn't God answer prayers which are all right, you know, they're not like for masses of riches. Sometimes, when we look back and we, we can see that, yeah, God made us wait. But when the time came and he answered that prayer, it was much, much better than if we'd had it when we wanted it. I want it now. And God says, I've got people. I want to move in to your cycle. People you're praying for aren't quite ready. When the time comes, they will be ready. And they will understand. And their experience will be such that the time will be right. Because I know this. If there's one thing I've learned, and I came to know Jesus sort of as much as I could when I was six, I'm 82 now. And in all that time, I know and I've proved so many ways that God's timing is perfect. I don't understand it because I'm only looking here. But I do trust in a God that's got this enormous picture and knows exactly what's going on. He knows my going out, my coming in. He knows my sitting down and my rising. If God loves us so much, then what can I do to say thank you? And with this, I'm going to, to close. One, I want to give you the words of a 12-year-old boy because it, it's the kernel of what we can do to say thank you to God. We were in Torquay. We'd met up with friends. We'd gone to Vatican. And I'm sitting by the path and with his, the wife, and we're people watching. And my husband and the friend had gone off on a walk. And I was conscious that on the little slope behind us, two 12-year-old boys had come. And they were pushing each other. They were laughing, you know, like boys do. They weren't making a nuisance. They were just enjoying themselves. And one of them came and sat next to me. And after a very polite conversation, he suddenly handed me a flower. Now, I didn't ask where he got it from, because I thought it better not to know. <laughs> but he said, I want to give this to you. And I said, thank you. And he said this, and this is it. I wanted to do something kind to someone today. 12-year-old boy, that bowled me over. I want to do something kind to someone today. That's how we can say thank you to God for his great love to us. Because as we reach out to others and show love to them, we are showing God's love. And it needn't be a big thing. I'm not suggesting you take a bunch of flowers and give one away. But when we reach out in love in a little way to someone else, we are showing God's love. And in that, we're saying thank you to God. And little things mean so much. A smile at someone down the road. The odd comment to someone. Since COVID, God's sort of made me talk to people on a bus. I've never done that before. But you see, living in England, we're so fortunate. Because to start a conversation, you only have to talk about the weather. And you're in. And if people don't want to talk back, they're grunt and look out the window, fine. But often, you'll find they're anxious to talk. Because there's a lot of lonely people out there that never talk to anyone. And just by reaching out, I'm not an evangelist. I'm afraid I can't bring it round to the love of, to, to talk about Jesus. But I can reach out in love and do something kind to someone every day. And as I do that, I'm saying, thank you, Lord, for your great love. I know you're going out and you're coming in. I know you're sitting down and I know you're getting up. 
And God does it because he loves us. And how do we know he loves us? Because he sacrificed his only son for us. And all right, I haven't got all the answers. We won't have all the answers until we get to heaven. So don't stand behind me because it's got great long list. But we can show love. We can show we appreciate God's love to us by reaching out every day with one little act of kindness to someone else. Just think what a different place this world would be if everyone did just that. May God help us to play our part in doing just that. Amen.